Hi folks, back again. This time I'm doing fault finding and servicing on five different boiler manufacturers. Yep, and we're gonna go through and discuss all the pros and cons of the heat exchangers. Enjoy, any questions, put in the comment below. Remember to like and subscribe. First time I've ever said that. First time I've ever said that. And don't worry, I'm not monetizing this video either. Enjoy. So when you come across these heat exchangers, the kebab one, and you see the rippling effect, that's because obviously they've been run on low pressure. Whenever you do a safety inspection, always put your flue gas analyzer around here because this gasket is known for leaking. It's a 12 mil spanner. Always get ratchets. I mean, look how good that is. I recommend Weira as well. So pull it on there. Undo the gas. So with these, you can lift up and turn, or with this one, you can just about lift up. I've taken those screws off just in case. I'm gonna give it a bit of a shake under the electrodes. This has been in my garden quite some time, so there you go. So, you always expect this. These these do go, to be fair. Change it. So you got rectification electrode and ignition electrode. So that one's on the way out. Look, you can see that, can't you? Now then, I will give you one little tip. So this tip really is a bodge, but you know, it needs must. If it's an emergency call out, two foot of snow, you've got to get that heating on. What you can do sometimes, if you get an electrode that's warped, if you put heat on it so it goes red, you can actually bend them back into position. So you get it glowing red, milli it back into position. It does work, it does work. Also check the, check the ceramics. But yeah, definitely have some of these on the van as, as spare stock. I even made the lawn for this video. Take the burner out. Give that a little bit of inspection look. It's all good that, it's not warped or anything. So for this appliance, you can get the manufacturer's own servicing tool. So I'll take the baffle out. Ta -da. One more. Turn around. Lift up. There you go. It's pretty filthy, look. Spring that mechanism. Got a Worcester servicing brush. Da -da 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 -da. This is a brilliant tool. I got this off Amazon, eight quid. 
an expansion vessel, Schrader Reader. Absolutely brilliant. So let's check what pressure is in the vessel. Let's see if it's holding pressure. Set up all. Point six. So just a uh, point six bar. So really it needs to be about 0.75 bar. If you go through my YouTube videos, you'll see how to size and charge expansion vessel. So really that, that is below. It should be 0.75 bar. If there's more floors above it, you should be adding really half a bar to, to each floor. So when you're surfacing Worcesters, to check if the heat exchange is clear or not, on the silencers, it's usually like a little nipple like that. Put your gauge on and check what reading you get. I can't tell you what the reading is because it varies amongst the models and the kilowattages, but really it needs to be at least minus three. So if you take five degrees off a heating return temperature, that will give you a guidance of what the hot water temperature should be. But according to Bosch, if the temperature difference between the boiler flow and the plate temperature is greater than 20, the plate is blocked. If it's less than 20, the hex is blocked. Lift, lift that up, pull that off. Here we have a wet pocket NTC. Wet pockets are good because they are accurate, but sometimes they just need a clean. So let's check this. Ricky, Hi. your dad's making a video. Get down. Hi. Wow. So here's the NTC readings, the resistance readings. So if you look, they go as high as 30. So when you go to work with a multimeter, you can't select 20 because it goes higher. So I'm going to go to 200. And in this instance, what I'm going to do I'm going to get the NTC, I'm going to place it just here and I'm going to disconnect all the cables so you get a real good reading. Fourteen thousand ohms. Fourteen thousand ohms. Here we have the manufacturer's guidelines. Fourteen thousand ohms. So it's a little bit lower, so about 21 degrees. Yeah, I'm happy with that. Resistance is telling me it's roughly 21 degrees. That's working. Next, let's take the heat exchanger out. First thing I do, I'm gonna, I'm gonna unclip it there, look. You can drain it down by the hose connection there, look, quarter turn. And with these heat exchanges, there's a back knot you undo, look. Can you see that just there? So I'm now round the back of the boiler. I've just done this so you can actually get better visuals. And there, this is the back knot that keeps the heat exchanger in. So I'm gonna undo this. So here under the connection, if I lift it up, you can just about see the copper connection. So I'm gonna lift up slightly and turn I'm going to turn this lever here and this will disconnect the connection. Undo the two screws, look. Now, 
I did have to prise that pipe down, if I'm honest, okay? Diverter valve. These diverter valves are the best type because of the paddle. They go up and down. They don't leak where a spindle one can leak, especially if the water's dirty. I'm going to take the cover off. There's the paddle. You can see it goes up and down. Slide that out. Brilliant. Test that in a minute. And there's the paddle. So sometimes if the heating comes on when it's not in demand, it can be this paddle maybe jammed or a bit, a bit seized. So let's have a look at this now. Divert valve paddle just moves up and down. Look how brilliant that is, look. It can get slightly dirty, look. Diverter valve, best way to check all diverter valves. Take the cover off. Power the boiler on and off and you'll see the diverter valve move. If you don't see the diverter valve move, that's it. It is knackered. Diverter valves are 24 volt DC. So here you've got some resistance readings. So the aqua sensor, that goes in there. I flicked a pin up. It's quite a good design, I suppose. One clip keeps the whole shaft in look. Isn't that good? We'll talk about checking that later. So let's talk about the aqua sensor, the water turbine. So this is the water turbine. Remember, I found this in the in the boiler, one clip and the whole thing came out. It wasn't secured this side because it was actually pushed in. So here's the aqua sensor, the water turbine. So basically it spins around and sends um, magnetism voltage through. Uh, <clears throat> so you measure between the black and the yellow. We'll do this in a minute. It's volts DC. So it's direct current and the symbol on your multimeter is two straight lines. So remember, direct current is constant. Uh, alternating current AC moves up and down in the turbine. So AC could be anything from 190 to 260. Now, fairly speaking, you can get DC voltage uh, 250 volts, even higher. So just be apprehensive about that. So you put the tap on, you put it in demand. Always check this demand. You put the tap on, and with it working, you want to be checking 2.5 volts. So, multimeter on. So you go to the straight line. You measure across the yellow and the black. And when it's off, it'll be five volts. And the reason why that is, a flow sensor water turbine uses the Hall's effect. So you've got, i use the blue one for this. So it's a Hall's effect. Five volts DC supply and it brings 2.5 volts DC back and there's an impeller with a magnet on and when the water goes through this spins round so when it's functioning it'll take half the voltage across and return to the PCB and that's how it works the, the impeller spins when it's functioning and sends a signal 2.5 volts back you know, there's other things you, you can look at the interface is the hot water tap symbol flashing. You could also check to see is the is the impeller free? Is it jammed? Right guys, let's talk about fault finding on the spark electrode. So here you got the spark electrode, so <clears throat> it ignites between them both. If it doesn't ignite, 
obviously check the gap, check the leads. But if you can hear the appliance igniting, um, going out, retrying to ignite again, it'd be the rectification probe. There you are. So rectification, basically what happens is the gas becomes conductive. So when it ignites, it converts AC to DC by going through the flame. So I've got a couple of tips for you. Always check, always check the lead, check the gap, check the connections, check it's fully pushed on, and also look for a resistance reading. So this is the Worcester one. I'm going to give you the readings for this in a moment. That's really quite thin, actually. It's not great there. And this is a very old glowworm one. If you look at the glowworm one, 1,000 ohms. So always look for resistance readings. You'll be surprised. They're not in the manual, but you'll still see them um, on the components. So. On your multimeter, select the horseshoe and allow 10%. So for this for this Worcester boiler, um, you're looking at 2,100 ohms. So really you got 10% of that. So plus or minus 210. To check the gas valve, put your manometer on there. Isolate it underneath, put the boiler on demand. If it loses pressure, you know the gas valve's opening up. So if you've got fluctuating hot water, it could be the plate to plate, it could be blocked. So this is how you take the plate to plate out. One screw there. And another screw just there. So we're at the back of the boiler now. I've done it like this, just so you get a real good view of it. So I've undone the two, two screws, lift it up. You can see there the notch in the gas, the kink in the gas pipe work. And it comes out like so. There you go. So plate to plates. You can replace them, you can order a new one, but what you can do is, if you want a fault final or do a temporary fix, this is a Worcester plate to plate, you can always tell a Worcester one because they're longer. And if you look at the two different metals, you've got stainless steel, looks like a bit of a, a copper material inside. So the two different metals, so they expand at different rates, preventing scale from actually sticking to the plate to plate. Now then, that's what they look like inside. So you can see how easy they can block up. So one layer is for heating water, the other layer is for cold water to become hot water. So the heating, the circuit around the heat exchanger heats the, the cold water up. So what you can do is, one side's the primary heat exchanger, the other side's the cold water coming in, going out hot. What you can do is, drop vinegar in, either side, boiling water, hit it hit it all over, shake it up and down, then blast cold water through it. That will cause a thermal shock. Again, vinegar, boiling water, tap it, tap it, blast cold water through, and that'll get it going. And the charging question, how do you take the pressure release valve off the Bosch? Never done it. Never actually done it, to be fair. And it's a topic that goes bizarre all over social media. People take the ball off the wall, people cut the pipe out. Um, just do whatever you feel comfortable. But this is the back of the boiler now, so you get a good insight. 
um, for a strategy of how to do it. So you could take the plate to plate out because you can see here, look, there's loads of room, isn't there? Unflip that, will come out. Some people I've heard take the actual cold pipe out so it gives you room. So if you get the cold, cold main here, look, it'll give you more room. Um, I've seen it where people have taken this out and actually cut a bit of the canvas away. I wouldn't recommend that. Don't destroy the boiler. So, circle it, plate to plate, cold water main. Now on these Worcester boilers, you see a lot of these white clips. And I, I was quite apprehensive about touching them because I never quite realised how they functioned. And they're a bit like a tie wrap. So you squeeze this here, and basically all that does, it, it releases the tension underneath. Turn that, squeeze it, turn it, and it comes off. So if you look inside there, like so, you can see the little ribs on the side. And that's how that little clip keeps the, the tension. So when you press that in, it's removing the teeth on that clog. And when you turn it round, you're just pushing the O-ring down. And it is, to be fair, it is quite secure. Boom. Done. Quite impressed with that. Obviously, <clears throat> before you put it back in, clean it and uh, check the O-rings clean. Still going. Now we're going to look at another Bosch boiler. This time it's a completely different heat exchanger. I'm not going to go into as much detail, but what I think is good about this video is... I've taken the canvas off. Look, so it's not in the boiler casing. So you can get a clear view of, of how to service this product. So first things first, let's get the burner out. So let's take out the silencer. Now I'm going to undo these two screws so we can take the this combustion flew out. Here we go. This lifts up slightly. There you go. On here, there's two circlips, one on each and one at the back. Um, take them off already. So I'm going to undo these, undo this bolt, undo this screw, that screw. Where are tools are the best? They're almost like jewellery, the way they're produced and the quality of the materials. So yeah, look how compact it is. So we're set. Latchet spanners as well.
So guys, if you're going out servicing, get one of these magnet trays. They're absolutely fantastic. Could save you a lot of time if you lose a screw and a lot of embarrassment. So one thing to point out, if you look at the burner lid, there's a little notch at the back so the burner lid can actually just pull out but it's essential that you unscrew it far enough so it just goes past the thread. Couple of tips here. So this is the same burner material that's made in the Intergas. This is Kevlar. This is the same material that they use in bulletproof vests. And the same as the, the glow and the valence, when it's down firing as well, there's little bristles. These can affect the ignition. So when you take these out to service them, just pat them down. So if there's any bristles up, it's not going to affect the ignition. You might want to clean all around there as well and along there as well. So when it goes back in, it's going to sit smooth. It's got some dirt in it there, look. On some of the um, competitors, like, like the Intergas one, <clears throat> their burners can warp, warp as well. So the shape of that is pretty good. The next thing... This is the intake here. Now, this model isn't too bad, but um, there's another model where this flap can stick and <clears throat> the flap is usually on the side next to the burner. So if you ever get a flapping um, fault, fault code, I can't remember what the fault code is, please forgive me. It's that, it's the non-return valve. Sometimes you have to take it out and just put a bit of grease on the edge just to stop it sticking so it can lift i think the fault code is something like f54 or something please forgive me so yeah always check that as well check the seal so you look at the scale build up in there this boiler has not been condensing, has it? You can tell, because it's not been cleaning itself. If you lowered the flow temperature of this, it would condense more, work more efficiently, and be cleaning heads. Look at that, look how filthy, look how filthy it is. So with this, maybe it had, I don't know, a poor air intake, uh, maybe the, the, the integrity of the flue wasn't very good. So this, this needs a thorough good clean. Water from the condensation trap, Vinegar, hot water, pour it down, and give it a good scrape look. That is absolutely filthy. Next thing to look at. Look at the state of those electrodes. So the spark electrodes need a bit of clean. That is worn out completely, look. It's quite obvious there's gonna be a rectification issue with that one. So let's let's check that, let's check the resistance. So I'm trying to do a resistance reading here for the electrode and the readings are unstable. Look at that look. So I haven't got the manufacturer's instructions on this model. So that's just not, well, it's not stable. So 
I wouldn't be surprised if the HT lead on this one's faulty. Another tip here we have heating flow NTC. So this is a dry clip on NTC. So if you're concerned that this is faulty, you can do two things. First of all, you can do a resistance reading. Next thing, turn it. By turning it around, just enables the NTC to touch the copper pipe surface better look. Can you see that? Next thing we'll do a resistance reading. Eleven or thousand. Happy with that?